everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Shane. Some of you may know me as the uh, person who wrote the Runer blog, but my name is Shane. Um, I'm here today with Christine Anderson. I said that correctly. Yeah. And I always have a hard time with this one. Claudia Ayas. Yes. <laughs> um, of Earth Empaths. Um, we're going to flip the script a bit a bit today. Uh, last time you heard us all together, uh, these two lovely ladies here were interviewing myself. Um, we're going to flip that a bit and I'm going to interview Christine a little today. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be a totally formal interview or uh, just a conversation that uh, I feel that some people may benefit from hearing and, and so that's going to be that. Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, kind of give you a chance to do something that I'd, I've noticed recently that you've never had the chance to do, which is kind of introduce yourself. I mean, uh, you guys started working on your, your website and mm -hmm. we've kind of got to know you through interviewing other people and through your writings and whatnot, but we've never actually said, hi, Christine, um, <laughs> who are you? And where did you come from? And how did you, how did you get to, to uh, creating or co-creating uh, Earth Empaths? Okay, yeah, well, the, that question of where did you come from is a big one, isn't it? <laughs> um, but yeah, let me, I, I have thought about, you know, how do I introduce myself? I mean, I, I am a little bit known through, you know, some other interviews that were done and some snippets in the healing work that we did while we were on the Project Avalon Forum. So, you know, there is stuff out there, but nobody's really asked me about who I am. And, you know, why am I here talking to this camera and talking to people and, and doing the work I'm doing? And, you know, I've often said, uh, you know, and anyone that listens, I'm nobody, you know, I'm, no, I'm nobody special. Uh, I don't have any lineage that I know of. I don't come from an Illuminati family. Um, I'm just a person that grew up in Southern California. I'm sure I had anomalous experiences as a child. I don't have full recall of them, but uh, enough memories come back that would indicate to me that I did. Um, and I was extraordinarily shy as a child uh, and an empath. And so I probably have a really, uh, and I learned to overcome that, that shyness, that inability to talk. Uh, people see me as very accomplished in the way I speak. They think I'm very outgoing. Uh, and not really realizing that it was a long process for me to to be able to come forward, voice my opinions, speak my truth, get over my own inner uh, demons, childlike and other, you know. So um, that's just a little bit about me as a younger person. Uh, always had an, a pulling and an extraordinary uh uh, desire to heal and you know I've been I've never and I've also never taken the path of becoming a professional <laughs> um, that was an antithesis to me of a true healer was to go to somebody else and get a title and say I'm this person and and yet that was a big conflict for me because being in the matrix world um, it's sort of a requirement for you to hang the shingle out and put your name out there and say you're this and you're that. And, um, it just could never happen for me. It, and, and the other thing I never did, uh, and I'll say a little bit about what I've learned and what I practiced, um, I never charged. Um, later on, and I was 23, um, I had a very deep prophetic dream. Uh, I was working as a bartender was working as a manager of a discotheque in the heyday of, you know, uh, the Bee Gees and, and John Travolta and all of that. And I woke up one morning from a night out and tending the bar and all of that. And I woke up out of a dream where I literally had found myself climbing on my hands and knees. Um, you know, one of these arduous dreams where you're just going up a mountain and I was barely making it, you know, bleeding hands, bleeding knees and a lot of pain. I reached the top of the mountain and a very bright being of light one might prescribe, describe her as Mary, I don't really know, but um, was really standing there emanating at me. And uh, the net, when I woke up out of the dream, I had a voice in my head that said, you have to leave where you are now um, or you're going to die. It was that simple. I've had several of those since. Um, two months later, I found myself uh, with a backpack. I had my nighttime disco clothes on, um, been out drinking and doing what people did during those days uh, with a backpack and nothing more in Mexico City. Um, and from there, that was the beginning of me finding me, me finding out who I was, 
uh, why I was really here. Uh, and I started to be able to free myself up from the U.S. I was able to start to follow a different guidance or a different thread. It was not easy. I mean, being finding myself there was, it was not an easy passage. Um, so I got into, um, I was in a very alternative town. Uh, a lot of healers, a lot of uh, people at that time, the New Age movement was just starting. Uh, so a lot of free thinkers. John Muir was there from the Muir Publishing Company out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, some pretty extraordinary people I got exposed to. Uh, psychics, clairvoyants, astrologers. I mean, everybody was here. So it started me on my spiritual search. Um, always still, though, I kind of followed that line of, uh, of healing. So I learned midwifery. Uh, I learned homeopathy. Um, at the same time, I always had a business going. I started with my own business. And um, and I always felt deep inside that charging for healing work just never really worked for me. Um, and so that's where I was. I was in Mexico. A young woman uh, started my own business, um, doing the work I did in an alternative community, doing a creative work I designed and made women's clothing, uh, was married, um, ended up having a daughter. And um, that was that. Um, it all was beautiful. I was part of a metaphysical group, a very dear, dear friend of mine, who's still a dear friend. Um, that was very instrumental in my life and, you know, helping me understand that I had a deeper longing than most people did. I uh, wasn't really content to live on the surface. Um, she once told me that <clears throat> uh, I was the only person of you know the hundreds that she had had taught over the years that actually wanted direct experience. It wasn't it wasn't just looking for a sense of a sur surface happy life, and um, and so I was there. I was very content in that. I had probably everything anybody within the matrix would really want. I had a nice home. I had a flourishing business. I had good friends. I was doing a satisfying work. Um, all of that was just, you know, one could have said that would have been a satisfying life. And and I guess as a lesson, do you mind if you just go on? You've got me on this roll here. Because there's no go nuts. <laughs> um, I guess one could say that there's, there's deep lessons here because um, I, I, Actually, you know, there's always things within any life that, that don't quite fulfill, right? And I had, but I had gotten to a deep place where it was literally, I was like, I was soaking and meditating in a, in a bath, which I commonly do. And I just had this deepest epiphany of my life at that moment where everything was perfect. Everything fit. Uh, and I was so satisfied and I was so full of gratitude for everything that had been given to me that I literally started, I would say that was when my, I really started vibrating at a different, a different frequency, was that, that much gratitude, uh, and I could call that gratitude love was coming through me, and I think for the first time I really knew love when, in that moment. And so I just was like, great, if this is what my life's about, I'm happy. You know, I give over to it, and that's that. Well, <laughs> two weeks later, I didn't have that life. <laughs> Two weeks later, that life was gone. And what? Uh, how, how did that? How did that change? What? Um, what changed there? Uh, I met. I was because of the healing aspect. Uh, I've always had. Also, I have a very deep, deep relationship. Well, we could name him many things. We just could call it Christ, or we could call it Yeshua, or all the different names that this avatar goes by and has been on our planet. I've always had a deep. Uh, not religious, nothing biblical about it, but just a feeling. So I was asking a question at the time. It was like, if he could heal with his hands, if he could do these healings, if he could, you know, touch somebody and they would be healed, then I can do that too. And so I, I looked for a teacher and I ended up finding a Reiki master um, through my friend, my, my spiritual teacher friend. Uh, she's found this man, and so I started going, and uh, I actually went for a while to translate for her because she didn't speak Spanish, um, and while I was sitting there with him, um, you know, I, of course, I became very interested in, in what he was doing in Reiki, and he did chakra balancing, and he used a pendulum, and he did Reiki, and very charismatic Mexican man, um, had a, an office in our town, and so um, I just asked, I said, well, I want to learn, and he said, sure. And um, so I went, and what he did 
was he put me through the Reiki initiations like really fast. He, he, uh, the first two flipped by, I mean, I literally flipped, I flipped polarities is the only way I can describe it. So all of a sudden my inner life was outer and I guess it would be akin in a certain way to a Kundalini experience. Um, so I was so vibrant at that time and I was so in the astral that I was barely on the planet. I mean, I was barely in the reality, the matrix reality. So, and it was so fast. It really was that I uh, literally uh, couldn't operate anymore. And, and, and that was that turned out later that this man uh, and his wife, um, he wasn't, um, he was using Reiki and that type of energy. He was actually, a, um, I would call him a, a black magician or a uh, energy vampire. That's quite a long story. I don't think I want to go into all of that right now. Uh, it was the first uh, time I had uh, contact with somebody of that nature. Um, worked my energy body, and I started to see him working other people's energy bodies. Uh, I was in love with him <laughs> because, you know, he was like this big guy to me at that time. Like, he really had so much power, I thought. Now I look at him and I go, ugh. But, um, so, yeah. So that, and within uh, two months of that, I had left my home, divorced my, I was separated from my husband. Uh, I went off to live by myself. And uh, I spent about four months, when I realized what this man was doing, I, let, I spent out four months in a major astral battle for my life. And uh, it was heavy duty. And, and at that point, I knew I would, had stepped into another world and another reality. So, you know, that was my indoctrination in this life into that type of uh, practice of, of magic and energy hooks and uh, psychic cordings and the whole deal. So, um, yeah, so that, that's, that was, it was a pretty deep, you know, dunk in the, in the dark waters. <laughs> I guess so. Um, it, it's an unfortunate reality that a lot of people kind of get into these groups and some of these groups are, as you experienced, uh, put together by, by someone who, who's doing it for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Um, they're not really there to try and help others. Mm -hmm. They're there to try and help themselves. And unfortunately, it sounds like that's what you bumped into. Yeah, and, um, and this is only the first one. This isn't the real story, not the one I really want to tell. Uh, that was my preparation, I think. Um, <laughs> you know, so... Um, well, you can uh, see through uh, that how it kind of comes in a stage because you you started off at a, at a really good place. <laughs> and then that really good place led you to a place that you thought was even better at first. And then it kind of brought you down a bit and and gave you a taste of, let, let's call it the darker side yeah. of um, these groups and, and spiritual teachings in general. Yeah. And then from there, um, where did you go from there? How was it well, uh, what a happened? Of building yourself back up? Yeah, uh, what happened was, uh, you know, um, it was really very interesting because all of a sudden I also had all sorts of abilities that I didn't really realize I had. And this is really going to be a part of what I want to talk about was that when you have like a Kundalini experience or the rising of the energy center, you are actually walking in a power and power itself is, is, is an elixir and power can take one over. And, uh, and that was really what was happening. I mean, this, this power had started moving through me. So like I was, I mean, I, I could read things. It was, it was bizarre. I mean, everything was alive. That was an everything. Everything was alive. The paintings on the wall, the trees, the paint, the people. It was, I mean, it was so overwhelming to be in that type of a reality. And so the thought that came in there was, well, you must be special, right? And of course. Right. <laughs> so of course. Right. And so I was like in that you are special and oh my God, you must be really special and this is it. And you know, you're going for it, girl, and all of that. And I had spontaneously started reading tarot cards, which I've never learned or done. And I would read them every day. And then one day I threw, I wrote, I did a reading for myself and the last card was the devil. And when I looked at it, my whole consciousness woke up and I went, I was like, I was one of those moments of like pure horror when I realized what had really been going on, that this man had actually been using me as a puppet and had total control on me. I, I actually had dreams of him like holding strings and moving me around and so when I had that realization, it was so body-like that I, I actually started throwing up. 
I got diarrhea. I started bleeding. I mean, it was like, uh, it was, and I, it was pretty deep at that moment. Um, and so I went, that's when I went into the battle to, to release myself from, from those strings and learned a lot about that and learned a lot about how an ego structure within a person allows that to happen. I, I never blame that person. I, I am, that's one of the really strong in me. I don't blame others. Um, so from there, uh, Shane, just to move that one along, that it had its, it had its lessons. Um, after that was over and after all of that died down and, and, and everything calmed down in my life, um, I remembered those experiences. And there's kind of a part of yourself that wants them again because they were so extraordinary. Uh, so I was looking still. I was looking for what's next in this life of mine, right? Where where do I go from here? And um, uh, one of the proclivities I have, I guess you would call it, is that if something comes into my field or my view that I haven't seen or experienced before, it's going to usually get my attention. And Good old curiosity. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, you know, I've gone through, and I think a lot of us do in this, you know, in these, in the, you know, a true seeker that's seeking their own inner truth or their own inner gnosis is going to experiment with or look through perhaps a lot of the other uh, philosophies out there. Some of them very deep, but, you know, we've got Buddhism and Christianity and all of that. But none of that would satisfy me Maybe because it was like something in me was driving me to find something else. Something new. There was something missing from it all that um, yeah, you, you like knew I, was out there and you couldn't you couldn't find within that material. Right. Or like I'd already done that. Yeah. You know, it was like a review. So it was like, OK, well, wait a minute. There's something driving me. That's just me. And uh, so during me, many years past, I don't really want to go through my whole, whole story here. Um, uh, I ended up remarrying another shaman type person. Um, and that relationship was extraordinary I mean, in many, many, many ways. But like a lot of these kind of like love bite or uh, twin flame relationships that are so extraordinary, when it turned, it went really bad. And um, I tried, so at that moment, I had a very good friend I used to go visit and he had an esoteric bookstore and I would sit and talk with him and, you know, he always kind of helped me through my, my, my trials. And uh, so I was sitting there with him one day and we were talking and I, he said a couple of things and it was just like something would click me and I was like, you teach something or you have a teacher, don't you? And, you know, that, that's my own, like, yeah, I do. And, um, and I just went, okay, I, I, I want to know what you want. I, I want to know what you know. I want to I want to know what, what it is that there was, there was kind of a mystique about it or just a mystery. And I felt something drew me in. And so I was, I was brought into this group. And this is the group that, um, and I, here I'm going to jump a little bit into why I'm talking right now, why we're having this conversation, if that's okay. Yes, please do. I mean, um, just to, for, for the listeners, I guess this, this conversation did come about for a different reason other than me wanting to ask you some questions yeah. about yourself. Um, you do have something that you would like to say, and this is a good segue into that. So go, right. go right ahead. Okay, so what I'm about to talk about, uh, first of all, uh, was at the end of the story, I was actually cursed. I was sentenced in a cosmic sentence, okay, that just about destroyed me. Um, and so for me to even talk about it publicly is a big challenge. Um, and this is uh, my story, all right? This is, this is probably the fundamental reason I'm here right now and what I've been able to understand about our journey and my journey and our journey is because of this experience. And yet it, it's so deep in me, it's going to be hard to get it out. So I'm going to kind of count on you to bring it up. Um, but what happened and, and people listening to this will know that um, I was married to Bill Ryan and I still am. I mean, we're still legally married. Um, and there's a whole process going on right now. There's a revealing happening. I want to say publicly that I have no intention to hurt or to harm as wanting only but to bring light to bear witness on something that needs to have the light shown on it. And this is really from the deepest part of me. Uh, 
something really evil happened there, something that just kicked me into gear. And I'm going to take this that kicked me into gear and I want to bring it into something that's positive. So when he told, he sent out a, a, a message to 20 people, uh, several of them, my dearest and nearest, uh, telling my story from a very, very, very distorted point of view. Uh, he took something that was sacred to our relationship to promises made and sacred to me, that I was able to reveal this story to him with the absolute certainty and his word that it would never be used. And I'm going to say this to all of you. If you're doing any work with anybody, if it, even if it's a good friend right now, if somebody tells you something from the deep part of themselves, the worst thing you can ever do is take that and use it against them. I mean, this is like, this for me, I call it high treason. To me, it remains high treason until there are men's made. And so, but- I would agree with that. I think like everyone has their own inner story and everyone has a right to keep that private. And if they do want to expose it, they also have the right to expose it on their own terms and through their own storytelling. It's yeah. no one has the right to take that story from another person and put it out for everyone to see from their own point of view without permission. And yeah. that, you know, that that's something that I think is important here for for people listening to to I remember think. when they're when they're dealing with other people. There's a reason why, you know, therapists and counselors swear all this to to keep things confidential and it's not about keeping secrets, it's about privacy. Everyone has a right to privacy. Yeah, I thank you for saying that because this is one of the one of the big boogie boo, you know, things that people get diverted off of all the time about, you know, secrets versus privacy. You know, there are things that hurt people inside. There are deep pain. Okay. And as I will talk about this, what actually happened was this curse, which has taken me from 2006 when I was ejected from Mexico with the most horrendous uh, trail of demons following me uh, that were going to keep me uh, from ever, ever having any interaction with humanity ever again. Um, it took me from 2006 until uh, 2012 to uh, be able to even talk about it. I mean, I was told that if I said anything or ever have contact with anybody again. I was prohibited from seeing my family. I were places I was not supposed to go back to. I was told that if anybody uh, uh, I helped me, they too would bear the burden of my curse. I was separated from humanity for all time. I mean, it's 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 one of those things that you, you just can't even imagine it. I don't think I can actually do it justice unless there's somebody listening that's had something similar. But that's how, how it was. And within that curse is a being. And within that curse is a dark energy of the darkest nature. And so when this was told, and it was told to people without my permission, and it, what got twisted was what he said when he said it was that those people, while well, they did do a very nice job with me, were actually right. I actually was an evil being and I actually did do harm. So he literally re-evoked the curse. That's really what he did. And by not being able to get to me, which he's been trying to do for a long time, he went for those the closest to me. And I say now, and I will say this on camera, it was a conscious act to do harm. So this is the thing, if we don't know ourselves, if we don't moderate our own being, you know, if we are so full of either our own rage that we would send something out to do harm for two weeks now, two weeks today, we have been under siege. And I'm not just, Claudia's here with me. She'll give testimony to this. There are others that will give testimony to this, what we've been dealing with. So I have to call it out. I have to call it out as a sovereign being so that there can be amends made so that the person and the people involved in this and every single person that's right there behind it is involved in this. And this isn't about me. This isn't about any one person. This is about us, our humanity. This is about how do we deal with evil friends. 
Do we go away? Do we turn a blind eye? Do we say, oh, he must be right and she must be wrong? It's not going to get us anywhere. And this is my passion. This is my passion. And this is what I learned during four years of my life, whether I was submersed with a dark master. I was in his field for four years. And nobody can really know what that's like. And he was a dark master. Do I have any ill feelings towards this being? I don't. He served a purpose in my life. He serves a purpose probably in everybody's life that he touched, but it's up to me, the being, to know what to do with what I learned. That nobody can take away from me. That nobody can tell me. And I'm sorry, Bill Ryan, if you're hearing this right now, you have no right to it. And I told you that when I was with you. I don't know how many times I said, you cannot speak for me. You do not have permission to speak for me because I already saw this coming. So I'll drop that one here. I don't know if anybody wants to say something behind these words, but I am calling it out for what it is. And I am asking for amends. Damage was done. Harm was let free. There are people suffering right now because of this. How does one take this back? That's a good question. I mean, I'm really shame within the world of this type of sorcery. How does one take back the harm that they threw out into the world? Well, um, in my experience, the, the best way to start is to, you know, notice that you've made such a mistake, that you have done harm, and to just, you know, you learn from that and know not to do it again you know, to, to stop repeating the same mistakes. See, we all kind of, at one point in time or other, we all fall into all the same mistakes. What kind of defines us is breaking those cycles before they become something we're locked into in, a, in terms of a loop. Um, so if you find yourself in a situation where you, you have knowingly done harm, you can forgive yourself and then move forward in such a way where you don't repeat that mistake you don't do that to another person and you 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 don't repeat it that it's that simple just don't repeat things mm -hmm. break cycles get out of the chains and move on um okay for, for people on the other side like the receiving side it's it's very much the same thing you know um one thing i always repeat is it's not what happens to the being it's what the being does once it happens to them this is true for both you know, someone doing harm and for someone receiving harm. Mm -hmm. You both have an equal responsibility to not um, not allow what happened to define who you are and to use it as a stepping stone to grow. Mm -hmm. So it's always a blessing, you know, the, e even the worst situations that you found yourself in your life, all of these different people that you've, we've attached ourselves to have, who have done our, us harm. In the end, it's uh, it's a lesson learned, mm -hmm. and you know they don't. We can't sit there pointing the finger at them, saying you know this this is all your fault. Yeah. We we have to move on from that place and say, what am I going to do now? Right. And what you're going to do now is is continue doing what you were doing anyways, and that's how you break that curse that was put on you. But you know, back whenever it was put on you, is to defy it is to not allow it the power that it wants to have over you. Okay. As you've pointed it out, the energy hooks, that's how this works. They get people, dark magicians, they get a piece of you and they put a hook in that and they've got that. And as long as you allow that to be something that they can hold over you, they will always have something over you. As soon as you can look at that and say, that has no power over me, that has no power over you. Right. Right. So let me jump in just a little, you know, so we have levels, obviously, or, or, or intensities of how we're dealing with certain sort of, of energies, right? And, and that's why I'm, I'm really speaking right now. If this was just between me and one other person, I wouldn't be speaking, but we're dealing with a community here. And yes. we're dealing with a community, a large community, and it's not just a forum. There's a larger community here. And so when you actually use the psychic intent or you take the consciousness of a group of people and project it onto someone else, or uh, in this case, both Claudia and myself, uh, why Claudia got thrown into this is, is still beyond me. I mean, I think Claudia and I know why. 
but for any logical, there's got to be a, a, a dissonance here because we're, we're talking about a thief, an embezzler, you know, uh, and then all of a sudden we've got to my lab, soul harvesters doing an unethical work. And so, you know, that's, I mean, there's some logical dissonance. There's a cognitive dissonance here that it's so shocking for me that more people haven't really woken up to. It's, it's blatant in that way. And, you know, so there are deep psychic uh, ties here. And part of what I want to do when we're talking today is to break those psychic cordings um, because I'm not going after anybody. I'm not going after anything. I'm not going back on any tact of that. I'm not trying, I don't want to keep those energy cords alive by any means. But we're not talking again, just one person. So, you know, it's like a consciousness act, you know. But at some point, Claudia and I both knew, especially when the black magic aspect came into it, that we had to ethically stand up and speak. You know, see, there's an ethics to that, too, because otherwise that energy was going to be given the free will that it wants through all sorts of people. And, you know, so it, it, it takes a lot of uh, force. Of, and I want to say it this way. It takes a lot of force to hold your ground of your own inner truth and your own inner light on the, at the onslaught of so many people consciousness being directed against you um and yet it's the most uh refining process for me uh because i've realized for me to speak i have to refine as many aspects of myself that might hold any negativity or i'm going to be consumed by this so i'm i'm actually in a, a certain sense I'm, I'm i'm in gratitude for this happening because it allows an aspect of, of, of uh, uh, to come out of me, uh, out of Claudia. It, it brings up some strength that I didn't know was there. And it's, it's like I'm, I'm in a fine tuning right now of like how, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go back to this. This is not about that. How do I, how, how do I use this as an ethical being to bring something into consciousness of, of these, of, of, of you? consciousness of a mass of humanity that's watching this unfold right now and uh, so you know perhaps going a little bit deeper into what happened I'm going to talk about the mandato I'm going to talk about a man named Alejandro I'm going to talk about a group of people that live at a small coastal village in Mexico very a handful of people and I'm going to talk about what it was like uh, to be involved with somebody of the nature that I was involved with and what I learned from it and why I got there, which is key, what parts of me, what aspects of myself were not uh, clean yet, what parts of myself were still looking for self-fulfillment, what parts of my ego were still being played out. And that's truly what any master, whether they play the dark hand or the light hand, ultimately will do with its student or its, its acolyte is bring out their own inner darkness so they can see what it is. And in that way, I have just a, a huge debt, uh, de uh, not a debt, I don't have debts, a huge amount of gratitude for, for this experience in my life. Because the torture that I went through and what I uh, went through during that time, uh, the type of training I got, uh, the belittlement of myself, of my ego, the playing with me, uh, the, you know, the, the, the psychic attacks in the middle of the night, the demonic playouts, uh, you know, all of that was going on at such a, a constant heavy rate during this time that I was there, you know, the cognitive dissonance that I was suffering constantly, uh, you know, I didn't know from one minute to the next sometimes who I was, you know, and yet, I was being played. I mean, I was being played. I was having somebody play me. They were bringing up my own energy, right? And then when they they finally, well, I was finally taken out. I mean, I, I mean, it was crazy. It was it was spiritual boot camp. I mean, we were asked to do things that were just so out of the normal within even the context of the matrix. It, it just didn't. And in my mind. 
I knew that that's what I needed. I knew that's what I wanted. I needed to be busted out of my belief systems. I wanted to be busted out of this matrix. I wanted to be, I wanted, you know, but the serpent or not the serpent, the, the whisperer that came through all of that was you're special. You're a chosen one. And this is something that anybody that has this going on in their consciousness has to step back from because that's how we were made to feel that we had some special knowledge that nobody else had. And we were 11 people on the whole planet. Uh, we were in Spanish, los portadores de la luz cosmica, which means the light bearers of the cosmic light. And we were tasked with holding that light for the planet. You know, so that gives one the, uh, the immediate sense of, of uh, elitism, superiority. Uh, I'm special, right? Only us, right? And we were not allowed to talk about it. But society or, or a group of that nature is to, you know, have that one little tidbit that they can say, you've got this and nobody else has got this. And that's what makes you important. And that's what makes you special. Exactly. I'm sorry. There is a dog barking right now. But um, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and yet it, for me, it's become a passage without having, you know, finally and ultimately understood that aspect of myself. So that means, what was I at that time? Well, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a pure life being at all. I was dealing with huge amounts of my own ego. Uh, I was also dealing with uh, a steady stream of past life memories coming up, many times of which I held positions of, of some uh, uh, importance uh, in the sense of, you know, either priestess or uh, even goddess. Uh, you know, so... All of that was coming up, and I was reliving it, which is a valuable experience. I mean, it was actually, uh, you know, and that's why I say the, the man Alejandro was, was actually feeding that energy into me so that these aspects of myself were coming out into play so that I would see them. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. You see, I was pretty full of myself at the time, <laughs> you know. Um, but in that whole aspect that was happening, there were things that were asked of us that never felt right to me. And that's where one has to pin their own authentic, ethical, essential self. It's like there's always a part of us that knows ultimately inside what's right and what's wrong. And we may go along with a lot of other people. We may go along with a lot of other things. But that voice for whatever it's worth, it never goes away. It's always there. One just has to learn to listen to it. And, you know, I was even aware during the, the upheaval of many years. I mean, it was crazy. It was just really, really crazy stuff. Um, that voice, when I look back, is always there. And so one of the tasks that we were given was to mark people. Uh, in other words, if somebody attacked us and see here, this is going to play right into the psychology of people that need to make enemies. All right. A lot of people and somebody knows who I'm talking about needs to have an enemy to feel right. So we had lots of enemies. And as a group of people, because we were kind of uh, odd, uh, we certainly called a lot of attention to ourselves. Uh, we had several businesses. Uh, I was spending my business money uh, rapidly. We put up three businesses. We built a three-story complex, building complex of apartments. Uh, you know, I probably went through, burned through about, sold a business, sold a property. I probably burned through about $800,000 in the time I was with them in three or four years. Of, of, I was basically supporting the group. Uh, because I had a very profitable business. Um, so just to go from that, um, so people know that, I, you know, but I was willing to do it. I was willing to give up everything for my own spiritual path. And I still am. <laughs> so, um, so what was I saying? Okay, so during that time, these aspects of like, we were the light bearers. Uh, there was a lot of stuff hooked to Jehovah. Uh, wasn't talked about, it wasn't a religion. Uh, we did a lot of um, uh, free consciousness channeled writings and we would get together and we would, we would ask questions and we would receive answers. And, you know, a lot of it was really okay. But the ask to me of the enemy is the thing I want to get to. And the thing that never sat really right with me, but I went along with it. 
and that's to my own detriment. And I, I will say this here because it's it's like pulling back any energy, any harm I did during that time was that uh, if anybody attacked us, and there were plenty, uh, you know, I mean, and a lot of perceived attacks. If anybody really didn't agree with us, they got marked. Okay, so we were given this uh, duty to mark people, right? So that these higher beings or these higher conceptos, okay, this is like, I'm talking according to them right now, if they ever hear this, this is the blasphemy of blasphemies that I'm speaking of, all right? That the conceptos would mark these other souls for future treatment. Now, that could be seen as bad or good. I don't know. I didn't even know what it meant, but I went along with it, but it didn't feel right. So... I, and, and so here we were, we needed to have, like, somehow we, we were creating enemies. By our very existence, we were creating these enemies. And we had put ourselves in some sort of elite position. And so I remember with fre- more frequent um, frequency, like, uh, we would, you know, be in a meeting or something, and, you know, we would talk about our enemies, and we would, you know, talk about, you know, what had to be done with them. I was so out of, I started becoming very out of sync with that. And as soon as I started to go, wait a minute, I'm out of sync with that. That's not right. That I can't, you know, I'm going to kept going along with it because I didn't want to lose the group. Um, I, I went out of residence and because they were, every person in that group was a high, uh, highly developed psychic. And so that was sensed immediately immediately and so all of a sudden me from this golden girl that was buying all you know putting up buildings and building you know I could get anything done I mean man you wanted it done you ask Christine she'll do it for you uh you know they had me up on that that level of you know like you know the Wonder Woman sort of thing and as soon as my consciousness kicked in without me even saying anything it was detected and they started turning um, and all of a sudden, it's, I, when I'm saying this right now, and I probably you feel this, God, Shane, you, I can feel it with you. It's like all of a sudden you see like these people that you thought were your friends, and all of a sudden there's this sort of demonic aspect, and you're dealing with oh, something totally different. And so I started to feel like I had to hide, and at the same time I was determined to be good and reveal all and not hold anything back from these people that were my brothers and sisters. So it was this constant uh, cycle of fear, confession, fear, confession. Sound familiar? Sounds like a Catholic church, doesn't it? Um, um, Yeah, but I was now suspect. I started to become the scapegoat. So all of a sudden I was like, uh, everything, all these eyes were cast on me with suspicion, and I started being chastised, uh, belittled. Uh, uh, fear was being driven into me that I was going to do something horrendous. I was going to do something so horrendous that I was capable of, like, literally destroying humanity. That's the level it got to. I would try to, you know, like I, we did a lot of emanate, emanation, like we would do a lot of light with our hands. If I raised my hand to give out light, I was immediately uh, looked upon as like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, so you, all of a sudden I'm in this mix of uh, uh, fear, uh, shame, uh, all sorts of things. And, and these are with people that I felt like I had to be with it. This is my spiritual past. This is my salvation. This was my redemption. Um, And it got, from there, it started to get really, really bad. Uh, A lot of, you know, really negative, negative uh, entities and dreams and phenomena. Um, So that went on for about six months, I think. About six months. Um, there, there's hard things that I can't even talk about. I really can't. Um, that's why I, you know, and, and that's, that these things that I could say right now, which I can't say, are things that I entrusted to somebody else. The only person on the planet that I entrusted this to, that's where it goes, guys, right? I'm not making this up, All right? This is like, so my story. Right, this is my story, and so 
at one point, we had been building this, uh, we made a three-story 11 apartment complex. Each of us was going to move into this complex. I had worked night and day on it. I did the designs with another friend. You know, I even got together enough money and we put in a little swimming pool because it was so bloody hot at the beach. Um, we were putting in the trees in the garden. And uh, <clears throat> so I was packing up my, I had printed a little apartment. Meanwhile, we were building and I'd already moved some things in there. I moved in some painting, little tiny, there were sales. I mean, we didn't, this was not a luxurious thing. And that was the other thing that kept me there too, because this wasn't about money. This was about, you know, supposedly deep spiritual process. So I was, was packing and, and getting ready. And uh, all of a sudden I had a knock on my door and uh, standing in front of me were four. I want to call their names out. I'm going to Kate. Carmen, Carolina, and Rosenda. Okay, my brothers and my sisters, right? Bound, bound by brotherhood and sisterhood. All right, we were actually bound. Those are broken now. And I'm saying this publicly. Those bonds were broken by me several years ago. All right, but we had been bound by word that we were going to be together. Listen to this, friends, for all of eternity. That's where it came in at, all right? Uh, they walked into my space, a full front attack of a wall of energy. They started packing my clothing and my belongings. They said, you are leaving now. You've been sentenced. Uh, you are leaving. And I had a car at that time. I had no money, had no money left, all right? Um, and they, within, I would say, about maybe an hour, between 30 minutes and an hour, I had all of my stuff that would fit in my little car that they threw in there. They were standing over me as I packed the suitcase, beach clothes, thong, you know, like flip-flops, uh, bikinis. I mean, this was my life. I lived at the beach, right? Sarongs, whatever. I mean, it, when it just got dumped into the suitcase. They had already taken everything out of the apartment we were just going to move into. They threw it into the car. And uh, I wore a gold triangle around my neck. That time was our, our symbol. It was a three triangles within a triangle with a dot in the middle. Uh, it was solid gold. Um, matter of fact, I purchased several of those for the different people. Uh, they took that away from me. Uh, they asked me to go to the business where I had uh, been running it and established it. I went there in my car with, with stuff fit in it. And uh, they said, we want your laptop. I handed it to them. They took the hard drive out of it, handed it to me, uh, and handed me an envelope with a handwritten sentence in it. And they said, leave now. It's in the middle of the afternoon. And you are not allowed. I think they read it to me or said it out loud that I was not allowed to see my family. I was never allowed to have contact with any of them again. I was never allowed to go back to the beach again. Uh, I was never allowed to go to Colima. There's a lot of stuff to do with the volcano there. It's for another talk. Um, and the force, people would ask, well, why did you do that, Christine? Why did you, why did you not stand up to them? It was because I was under a spell that had been wrought and forged in me during those four years I spent with them. And this wasn't just them. They were being directed by Alejandro and his wife. Right. The same day, another friend of mine was also expelled under similar circumstances. I don't know how he is. Never saw him again. And I found myself driving. So I started north along the Pacific coast of Mexico. And as I was driving, my body started violently shaking. It was, uh, and I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who had it or anymore. Uh -huh. I spent the night not very far away in a hotel. I didn't have, I spent that night in absolute terror. I was so ashamed. I felt like I had done the worst thing any human could ever have done. I felt like that's what was put on me. And I don't know, I really don't know what this even right now is I'm repeating it. Right now it's fucked. Right? Later that day, I went to a friend's house. 
And then I knew at the beach, that's an old friend of mine. I was so out of sorts that I was like, literally I had to repel myself away from her because I thought, oh my God, if she helps me, she's going to be destroyed too. So I just started driving north. Um, I spent a day in Vallarta and even when I, I was in Puerto Vallarta for a day and I did have at that one moment, I had a blind flash of like, oh my God, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. You know, so it was such a mix of emotions of, of between terror and freedom and, and loneliness and solitude. But, um, <clears throat> you know, so I spent one good day in Bayarca and didn't know where to go. So I just kept going north. Just to, uh, I just want to ask there, what, what was it that they had accused you of? Like, what was it that they wanted to crimes push you away for doing? Crimes against humanity. What were the terms of that charge? Like, what was um, the, that's just a title, right? Specified. So what's the term? It was never specified. It had to do something with, uh, I can't say it. It's too personal. It's too personal to my family. I can't say it. Fair. Okay. Um, you know, when you have somebody you love with all your heart and all your soul. Okay. They accused me of protecting that person. Right. It's family. Real family. So, um, but somehow they twisted that into um, crimes against humanity that I hadn't fulfilled my, my, um, I hadn't fulfilled or I hadn't, I think, you know, I mean, if I analyze it now, it's really clear. I was seeing what was going on. My consciousness was waking up and I became very aware of what's happening. I started having dreams about Alejandro and his wife and I was having like, you know, astral battles all night long, you know, in my dreamscape. And I, and, and so a part of me was like, and I realized I had, they also realized it's the same as the first shaman I already talked about, that my power was growing through my consciousness. That happened with the first guy too, because he kept saying, where's your power coming from? Where are you getting your power? He wanted to know. So I think they became aware that when I started to go out of resonance with the group think that it was, uh, I needed to be put down bad. <laughs> and so, no, no, I can't, I can't say, but yeah, it had something to do with my family. You did, uh, you did answer my question there. Okay. So thank you. Okay. So, um, Anyways, um, I had at that time, uh, I, I had grabbed, I, fortunately, in the time I was running out the door, uh, some jewelry, I had some gold beads. I had some, a few like trinkets of that nature. And so I had that with me and I had uh, two credit cards, uh, but no cash, none, zero, nothing. I had no access. My business was gone. My, my home was gone uh, where I had lived in central Mexico. All that had gone to, to build the, uh, uh, the businesses in the apartment. So, um, but I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate because I had some access to something that could keep me going. So I, uh, I also had, uh, ironically, I mean, I had papers. Uh, I was in the process of becoming a Mexican citizen. So all my papers were on file in the uh, immigration. So I'm in my car in Mexico with no papers, no legal identity. I had my passport, I did have my passport, my American passport, but all my Mexican papers, my residency, my, you know, everything I had worked years and years to build up, that was all abandoned. Uh, and I had to hit the border uh, with no papers. So uh, I just knew, that's all I knew. The only thing I knew at one point was drive north. That was the only thing I could think, just go north. And I was like, okay, I'll go north. So I drove uh, north out of Mexico. Uh, one night I stayed in Torreon, Mexico. Now, and I want everybody to understand this too about Mexico. It's probably the most replete with witchcraft country on the planet, okay? I don't know of any place that has more demonics than this country here, okay? I mean, it's pretty well known. Even among sorcerers, it's pretty well known, all right? So from everything from low-level sorcery to high-level sorcery, it exists here. Um, so I, I, I hit a, I hit Torreon in the middle of a torrential, horrific rainstorm with, you know, thunderbolts of lightning. And I got a little cheap room and that night, and I'm going to tell this because if people don't get this, okay. If they don't get the depth of it, I've never been able to tell it because nobody gets the depth of it. I think with you guys, I can't. 
uh, that night in that hotel room with lightning and rain, you know, and it was a cheap room, so everything came right through all the walls. You know, I was in the middle of that storm. Um, one of the parts of my sentence was that I would be recogido por todos los tiempos. I was going to be isolated for all time. That's one of the terms of my curse. If I ever spoke to anybody about this ever again, if I ever had contact with any other group, if I ever turned to my parents at home, if I ever saw my family again, if I ever contacted anybody within the mandato again, that was my sentence. I lived that, that night. I lived that, that night. My whole soul body. And I know that there are people that hear this that know this because anybody that's been MK altered, anybody that's been my lap, okay, anybody that's been through this knows what it feels like. I was picked up and I was lived in absolute isolation from everything. Full consciousness of who I was, of everything I'd ever done, and that meant every crime I'd ever committed. That meant every evil deed I'd ever done. That meant every good thing I'd ever been. I was in full consciousness with no way to ever rectify any of it. That's how bad it was. That's the night I don't know how I survived. I don't know why I got let out. I know I had to experience it. That's all I know now. This that experience is really what drives me, what really gives me the empathy that I have and the compassion that I have. It's a level of deception. It's a level of manipulation that very few ex have experienced. I, I would probably even go so far to say we've all experienced it. We just haven't remembered it. So from that night, I drove in full terror. Full terror. My experience was terrifying. And else I knew I could drive north. I had to get to the border. I had to get across the border with no papers. I had to go back into the United States, which was terrifying. I had no money, no job. I was six, 56 years old. Right? Nowhere to go. For me, at that moment in my time in my life, I had nothing. I was going to end up on the street. That's how I felt. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just getting pretty emotional about it. Let me sit with it for a minute. Okay. You know why I'm talking right now? Because this is what we're in for, folks. If you think that right now anything you're doing is having any effect on our planet, if you don't understand that force of evil that wants to put us all in lockdown, if you don't understand what real true terror is, if you haven't confronted your own darkness, if you haven't confronted your part of that, and there are those of us that are out here doing this on the edge. And so for for that not to be understood, it doesn't make us heroes. It doesn't make us special. It doesn't make, we're nothing. We're really nothing. That's what I want to tell you. Okay. So I did make it across the border. As soon as I hit the United States, I was being followed by policemen everywhere. I got pulled over. I got harassed. I was threatened to take to jail because I didn't have car registration. I was on my way to get my car registered and I got pulled over with some really brutal policemen and threatened me. You know, so that's what, when you're in that space, and this is a good lesson too. I want to say this to, to some of my dearest friends that are still struggling through these harassments. We get put into these spaces and that our own energy will bring that to us. So there is a way out, all right? We have to, we have to find our own inner strength to be able to get out of it because I lived through that of bringing that to me through this. And I don't say it in as a judgmental way at all, but that was also done. And I, it happened, you know, so 
just a little thing that we can get past these things and we can, we do have the ability, each of us to, to get out of it. But during that time, you know, that's all I could experience. So, and I, and I, so I don't say it with any judgment. That's all I could experience was up. I drove north and I drove north. And during that time, I was like, where am I going? Um, north, north, north. I'm going, oh, shit, I'm going to hit the Canadian border, you know, at some point. And um, I realized that I really couldn't go into Canada because I don't have Canadian citizenship. I wouldn't. What was I going to do? And I fantasized many things. I fantasized going up into the, into the Canadian Rockies and just like crawling into a cave and dying. That was one of my favorite fantasies. I felt so ashamed of whoever I was at the moment. Um, you just keep going. That's all you do. You just keep going. Uh, yeah, many cold nights. It was April of 2008. Yeah, April of 2008. Uh, election time, hey? Eh? That was a big time on, uh, big time uh, on in the United States at that moment. I hadn't lived there for 25 years, so I wasn't even really aware of what was happening there. Um, and um, thought of going to Canada and knew that if I went to Canada, I would die because I couldn't be in the dark that much of the year. So at one point, I was in Wyoming one night, and uh, it was snowing, it was icy, and uh, uh, I just heard Spokane. So I heard Spokane. And that gave me at least enough of, of some direction, go to Spokane. So I started at that moment just following little things little little things you know like some little part of me that was going to take me somewhere uh that I needed to go and I ended up in in Spokane Washington that's where I ended and uh was able to um I you know it was always a surprise to me because I felt like such a shell that people still related to me and um I could still talk to people and Somehow during that those years that I was in Spokane, I, I somehow reestablished a sense of self. Uh, it wasn't a very strong one. <laughs> I finally got back into doing healing. I ended up my salvation there was I uh, got a job again now by you know I would say intervention. I got a job in a supplement store, and uh, as soon as I was back in that element of uh, being of service and uh, being with other people that were of service, that that really uh, established, uh, brought me back. Uh, I still hadn't dealt with the curse. I still hadn't dealt with any of that. Uh, I had two angel friends, uh, Ben and Max. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and that's why I do what I do, because two people, two simple people, two unknown people, two not famous people, okay, two ordinary people, offered their hand to me and saw my light when I couldn't see it. That's how much that means. So, you know, I don't forget those things. And I don't know how many people right now on the planet need just another being to acknowledge their inner light when they're in their own dark night of their soul. Powerful. <laughs> it's not magic. It's just people loving people. That's all it is. It's simple. I was blessed. I was blessed with those two people in my life. And, uh, you know, all, all was pretty good. I mean, I'd even, you know, struggled through a lot of things. I'd even, uh, you know, I didn't like working for corporate America at all. It was disgusting and demeaning. And I learned a lot about humility during that and a lot about how people live, you know. Man, you know, if you want to be humble, go be in, go get a job, people. Go work in middle class America or lower America. Go live there and see just how people have to live. It was a very humbling experience. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so because I didn't really like, I don't like, you know, I don't like bosses. <laughs> I don't like people telling me what to do. Never have. Um, I, uh, I started an online jewelry business, and it, it really was a huge, huge struggle to me. A, a good year just to get a website going. And, you know, with a few amount of funds, try doing something on uh, eleven dollars an hour, living in America, um, uh, using. I did have those two credit cards, so um, I was able to start a small online business. And uh, just about the time that it started to produce a little bit of income for me, uh, 
uh, you know, thinking that, oh, okay, well, maybe this is going to be my life now here, and I, I'm okay with it. I have a few friends um, doing some satisfying work. Um, I could see that I could get out of the corporate uh, mindset. Um, March 11th came along. And, um, that's Fukushima. Um, by then, I had been spending uh, hours every night and day. I was listening to the internet. I was listening to everybody from Jordan Maxwell. That's when I got into Project Camelot. I listened to David Icke. I mean, I could, Michael Tessari, and you name it. I was just, you know, that was my company. You know, I'd go to work and come home, and I'd listen night and day to to people. Uh, so, you know, at that point, I was really waking up to another aspect of what was happening on the planet. Um, so when Fukushima happened, um, the first time in my life, I became the whole planet. And I realized that that wasn't an isolated event, but that was going to affect all of us. And uh, it was a very profound moment in a way for me because my whole world that I had just built again was shattered. And I was like, oh, this is, I mean, it became false security. <laughs> you know, the fact that I had a job, that I had a friends, that I had a business, uh, you know, that literally in a very visceral and visual way, it was like looking at my, my life that looked pretty nice again. It looked like looking at glass and it, it, it just like I watched it come down. It just broke into a thousand shards again and shattered at my feet. And uh, I was uh, directed to come back with I had met a woman at the uh, supplement store, and uh, she was going to manage a hotel in Vilcabamba. <sighs> I'm going out of the Mondato story, am I? Yeah. Um, I want to ask a question there, actually. Yeah. Uh, you've just described a, a different event where your life kind of fell apart or shattered at your feet as you explained it. But that one is very different because that wasn't... Um, that's something that kind of came through you as opposed to through a group and yes. um, was pushed onto you. So yeah. are, are you able to perhaps um, describe the difference in how that felt for you? Yeah. Um, what I realized in that moment was that I had in my need of feeling secure in the world, had managed again to build up a, uh, a, a, world, or a world matrix around me. So even while I had like the, you know, I had at that point, I had all the knowledge about, you know, what was happening, you know, the, the black government, black ops, you know, uh, I mean, I had all of that going. I knew about the FEMA camps. I knew everything in that way. Um, so, but I realized that what had happened there was I had built a false, a false paradigm for myself uh, that I thought was secure. And so when that shattered, I knew at that moment um, that, that wasn't from outside of me. You're right. It wasn't. Uh, I hadn't completed that. I, I knew that 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 was fake. I knew I would never be satisfied with it. I knew that you know, you know, having a nice job in middle class America and having a you know an apparent a nice looking apartment and all that and being in in the business again. Uh, yeah, my my consciousness knew full on that that was not going to satisfy me. So yeah, very different shame. I'm glad you point that out. Um, you know, so that's that. I mean, that is the case of that. Uh, I'm still under the curse at this moment, though. I'm still under. Uh, I haven't told anybody about it. My two good friends know that something very deep happened to me. Oh, I also pulled in some pretty interesting dark people into my life while I was in Spokane. Another another story. Um, but um, uh, but they were so beautiful to me and they were, they would always say, well, we don't know what you went through, Christine. We don't know. We just love you. You know, it was that simple, you know? It should so, be that simple. That, that's, that's what the first <laughs> four or however many groups should have been able to say to you at that point, instead of, um, instead of pushing someone out, like let's let just back up for a second here. You're in a group dynamic. It, within that group dynamic, you notice someone who, let's just say that you're all in the consensus that that is a dark being and that being has a problem and that being has, you know, call it whatever you want, call it an entity attachment, call it whatever kind of possession. Where, how are you helping that being by throwing them out into the world, you know, like by, by 
breaking them down and, and then pushing them away. I understand defeating the demon or, or taking away the entity or anything to that nature in it, but to ostracize the person at the end of it is, are you really helping at that point? Let's just say that you don't do anything to accomplish helping that person before you push them out into that world. Essentially what you're doing is you're taking a loaded gun and you're throwing it out into the street for someone to find. And even that, that way of looking at it is not a good approach. Yeah. So, you know, the, that approach that you, you, you found in Spokane that, that uh, we don't care where you've been. We, we love you and we want to help you. You know, that, that should have been the approach from the first group as well. And, you know, it, it wasn't because it was a lesson you needed to learn granted i'm just yeah. saying in general you know if if you find yourself in that situation instead of you know shoving that person away from you maybe do what you can to help okay. uh, you know and yeah. you, you know don't have the expectation that you know you're going to help them you're going to heal them because that's that's not that's the way things work. but you can you can give it your best shot before you you know throw them away yeah uh, I'm going to go a little, I think, hang on just a second. I'm seeing some messages pop up here and I don't know if it's a question or. Okay. I think already um, just, I'm sorry. I just distracted, but that's okay. Cause we're kind of breaking into something here. And I, I, I don't mind because I, if anything I have within me is, is, is a teaching, right? I mean, my experience, like Shane's experience is a teaching. Claudia's is a teaching. We're each other's teachers and we're each other's students. You know, you said it in the beginning, Shane, I don't even know if this got on the recording, is that each of us is a unique being, all right? I mean, we have an empty even, we could call ourselves. We have an ID, you know, we have an identity. We have, and then that identity is expressing from how deep we get into our essence. We can't really fully discard all of that. But uh, in the mandato, they called it the ego deidad, which is our God divine ego, or our essence, or our essential self, right? And so what I've learned during all of this is to peel away the layers and the false belief systems and the matrices. Um, all of that is to get to that essence, Everything that's been around us, that you know, all these creations and all these false beliefs and these false matrix and, and everything has kept us from that. So I'll say right here for me, I chose this. I take a hundred percent responsibility for my chosen. I chose this for my own self. And I think we all do ultimately. Right? I chose this lesson. I obviously, at some level of my being, chose to go through this so i don't blame not here to blame anybody for any, but even this moment that i'm speaking right now to the people that i'm speaking to to the situation that i'm immersed in i still chose this so what am i going to do with it and what you just said Shane, is like it's a duality and and this is, and i all put this out here now for us to consider okay i don't have the answer to it when i look for a state of being that I could call free, freedom. That's the state of a completed aspect of, of this being that I am that is in touch with that ego that, or that inner divine me at, at getting closer to my core and my essence. I'm not using my ego, my false beliefs, my false moralities to make any decision. So, and I'm free from those moralities and I'm free from those false beliefs. So any instant, anything that comes up, what I need, or what I do, I endeavor, which has come, become more and more of what I am, I listen inside, I wait until a movement moves me. Now that movement may to others, look like it's not very kind sometimes i can be fierce it may be in this situation that we're dealing with in pa and br and all of that and all this is coming up it may look to a lot of people like i'm doing something to cause harm but i know i'm not i'm trying to reveal something for a being okay a very beautiful being that's trapped in his own complex his own matrix of his own making 
And I'm trying to bring forth my fiercest love in that. I was subject to that, okay? At one level, I decided and it was done. That's it, right? And so love can shine in many ways, friends. It doesn't just come through the kindest word. Love is felt, love is known. Love is felt, it is known. And until we know love in ourselves and for ourselves, and we forgive ourselves for all of it, and then when we can peel away in the crucible of our own being, then we can start to shine at one another with a surety. Goes to surety without doubt, all right? That that light is going to have an effect that needs to have, not because my ego wants any outcome, but because it just is. So so that's my, my thing about that. Like, uh, I don't know. People don't, you know, I don't know what anybody needs. I really don't. I know everybody needs love. That's all I know. That's all I know. And I know there are beings out there. There are people so deep within their own darkness that they know not love. This is my whole passage was that I could learn to know love. My biggest fear when I came into this world is that I would never know love. That I was incapable of knowing love. That was my shame. That was my guilt. That was my fear. That was everything came from that, from the time of the tiny child that I was. My first memories are, I'm not lovable. I don't know love. I'm not lovable. Those are my first, I'm guilty. I was guilty when I was baby coming in. You know, so, you know, that's, that's what I want to get. It's like, how do we, we, the people, the divine sovereign beings on this planet, get to that place in ourselves that is beyond doubt and fear? That's what I really want to talk today, you know? And so, yeah. And so I have to say right now, Ecuador, something in me and spirit align and moved me to Ecuador, right? Where I thought I was going to the end of the world. My little head at the time said, I'm going to the end of the world. You know, at 2008, everybody remembers what was happening? I mean, 2011, huh? America was going to fall. The whole economic system was coming down, right? Right? I, you know, Mike Adams and the health ranger was in El Bilcabamba. I mean, I was going to the one safe place on the planet where I was going to survive. That's why I saw it, you know. And I knew, I felt, well, your life's over, Christine, but that's okay. You're going to be safe. Kind of a weird thought like that. <laughs> but that's how I saw it, right? And, you know, and, and I'm still running from the curse, you see. I'm still running from that which haunts me. I'm still running from what hasn't been resolved. I'm still trying to find safe haven. We have to look at that, don't we? Safe haven. Anyways, uh, Ecuador. I'm in Ecuador. <laughs> I'm running a hotel called Madre Tierra. Well, that's something else. Can I say this here? Because I'm on a roll. Each individual here, okay, listening, me, we all have an epic life. And that epic life is shown to us. The names of the places, the names we are given, the names of our friends, the numbers we see. All of that is a really deep, rich tapestry when we can kind of get out of the surface judgmental self and start to really like, whoa, you know, everything's talking to us. So I'm in Madre Tierra, yeah, Mother Earth, there I am. You know, the health ranger's there. You know, the whole thing is like, you know, it's supposed to be the new Garden of Eden. And who walks through the door two weeks later? Bill Ryan. Him and Anelia were there doing a conference up at Monte Sueños, at the, up at the Mountain of Dreams. Right? And while I had listened to, you know, quite a bit of Camelot at that point, so I knew who he was, you know, I didn't really have Gaga Goo Goo eyes. So the whole town was abuzz with his presence, and, you know, uh, you, you know, which is, you know, is all I heard because this hotel that I managed had a big veranda restaurant and everybody came there and, you know, uh, you know, so that was kind of a big social gathering place. And, um, yeah, so he walked in the door one morning. I was in my pajamas making my coffee in the, the restaurant for the hotel. We weren't open yet. And he turned around, and when he turned around and looked, I went, oh, oh you're Bill Ryan, right? Had coffee. I sat with him for four hours that day. Didn't even get out of my pajamas, didn't get up and attend the, attend the people in the restaurant at all. We just talked. And, uh, you know, at that point, uh, 
I'm still feeling I had no real sense of myself. Uh, I was quite frightened, frankly. Uh, I was very unsure. And so all of a sudden I felt like I had a big male presence in my life. Somebody was feeding back to me that I was okay because I had met Bill Wright. So that's where that one, that one went. And I will say to him, I've said it to him many times in person, looking eye to eye. I am so grateful for everything he gave me in that time and everything he helped me with and every ounce of energy that he poured into me to help me bring out this whole curse thing. He did that for me. He really did do that for me. That's why it's so difficult right now to have it turn. There's a reason for it. I get it. There is a reason for it. You know, just that's okay. It's not a blame game thing. It really isn't. Um, but it, it, it was, you know, a, a really amount of dedication during, uh, during that time. And so little by little, those layers started coming off. And you know, it took about a year and a half. Uh, you know, it was involved with some other people that did like, you know, so real professional auditing sessions on me. Uh, I am very uh, grateful to them also. I'm not into Scientology, never have been. Matter of fact, I have a lot to say about that at some point. But uh, with somebody that's ethical, uh, some really important work was done. And I count the woman that helped me, my friend to this day. And uh, I love you. I love you. I really do. I mean, she's uh, uh, ethical. That's, she's an ethical healer that's what she is and she knows what she's about and uh so really what happened shane and really at that time is i started to uh i was able to go this is the, the psychic bonding and all the ties that are hooked onto a curse of that nature i was able to start uh peeling them away and and getting them out of my energy field and, and as that was happening christine came back finally who we call christine right now um you know, she started to find she had a voice again. She started to find out that she was a, a real being again. Um, before that time, really, honestly, I was just an act. Uh, always surprised that people would like me. Always surprised that people would think I was cool or okay or nice or anything. Because inside I was an act. Inside I was empty. So to start to that process of, of reestablishing my own inner you know, at the point when I was first there, it's very different when you, you depend on who you are by looking at how the world views you, which is what I was caught in. I was really dependent on how people viewed me because I didn't have anything inside at that point. So uh, good point for people to think about how dependent are you on others' projections onto you or how they see you. Good point. It's a good point to look at. Uh, part of the reason I got, you know, into the situation I got into. Um, but yes, yeah. So I, as my real, as these layers, as these false things, these things that had been bonded and brought into me and, and you know, embedded in me by, through fear tactics, say, you know, many numerous ways. I mean, it was pretty heavy duty stuff. As those layers came back, I came back. And uh, with that coming back, I started to be able to move back into those spaces myself. Uh, I started to be able to go back to the beach astrally. Uh, I started to confront the people that had put the curse on me. I was able to stand in front of them astrally. Of course, I didn't go back there physically. Um, and I started pulling out my energy. And I went into the cafe. I went into the building that I had built. I went back to all my stuff that they still had. They had my most precious stuff. They have a diamond ring of mine. They have a, uh, a statue that was given to me that's a 1,000 years old of who I supposedly was in India. So they had severe items to do magic on me with. Let's just put it that way. So I just really had to go into those spaces. And anybody can do this work themselves. If you feel like there's somebody that's manipulating you, it is you are able to do that. And you can, by your own sovereign law, by your own word, revoke these things. You know, you have to get a certain amount of energy. And you don't have to have peace on. You just have to know that I'm here. And you can start to unwind these things. And so that that what was happening. And as that happened, all right, 
as I was able to more and more uh, get solid, then all of a sudden in my life again here in Ecuador, I started getting demonic attacks again, immediately. I was getting electronic attacks. I was getting demonic attacks. I was, I mean, it was like something didn't want me to get back to me. And so I went through the next two and a half, almost three years of some of the more serious shit. I'm sorry, you know, it's not fun. You get tired of it after a while. So, um, yeah, uh, but I learned and I learned and I learned and I got back to myself. And I'm going to give something that I would like to give out to anybody that might. Oh, gosh, I don't know if I should. I'm not professional. <laughs> I'm sorry. I got to have a little humor here. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I mean, come on, people, let's laugh a little. I mean, my God, come on, you know. You I'm, start the whole world laughing. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I, want to do the, I want the Shane ugly dance. I'm going to interject it right here. Okay. Do I have your permission, Shane? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, good. good. I mean, I've gone through the, all these like you know, roller coasters of emotion. Let's bring some humor into this. Oh my God, it's a farce. Okay, my professional self never was. Okay, but my life lessons. You know, if I'm talking, uh, let me share that. Okay, I during this time of demonic attacks again. I mean, it was bad. I mean, I was like being thrown on the floor. I was being face slammed into things. I was being pushed down stairs, you know. But I wasn't, I wasn't succumbing to it in the way I had before, right? Uh, but, you know, here's that thing. Bill, here's that thing. If you think you need an enemy to prove that you're right, you're wrong. Okay? We were calling in all our own enemies. Okay, there's a belief system out there in this freaking what do you want to call it? Conspiracy theory, twisted new age movement that has become that we prove ourselves by the amount of enemies that we have. That's a falsehood, that's a lie, but it sure keeps the dark side happy, doesn't it? As long as you're doing that, man, you're going to get slammed. It's also a tactic. It's called creating a monster to save other people from, which is part of, you know, we, we've talked before about savior paradigm, something that um, many people are affected by. Well, a, a part of that is the hero paradigm. Right. What the hero will do will come along and he'll create a monster to fight, you know, just like creating their own enemy. But other people see him do that and look at him as a hero or her as a hero. Or them as the heroes, right? Exactly. And so you've you've created something to protect others from. Right. It's so well put. You know, it, it goes. I mean, we could go really deep into that. It's not the place right now. But that whole savior meme, the savior meme, and the victim meme. There they are. They're interlocked as can be. And if you're either one, you're right there, right? And usually, the savior has victim. The savior will always have victim locked in itself. It has to. It has to. Just look at it, friends. So if we're on a pathway here of soul sovereignty, <clears throat> the recovery of our soul essence, the recovery of our divine sovereign beingness, it's a state of being that is inherent in every one of us, every single, from the darkest to the lightest. It's inherent in us. And we're all here right now. <clears throat> so what helped me, and I wanted to get, I wanted to, and this is something that came again from the Mandato Alejandro experience. He would always talk about our cosmic position. I never knew what he meant. But he would talk about it all the time. Your cosmic position. Tu posición cosmico, he would say. You know, and I think all of us sat there and scratched our heads and went, what's he talking about? <laughs> you know, he was a great teacher, guys. All right. He was teaching from the dark hand side. All right. He was a great teacher because he didn't ever tell us anything, really. He would just put these things out there and it was like, you guys figure it out. Right. So that always stuck with me, though, just like certain things that came through Carlos Castaneda and Don Juan. Just certain things follow the path of the heart. Right. They stuck with me. I cling to nothing I cling to nothing therefore I have nothing to defend there's simple teachings but they're 
teeth, right? So those phrases have always stayed with me. This position cosmico. What's that? Okay. And so during these really hard times of, you know, lots of upheaval with our partners and demonic attacks. And I mean, there was a period of, of I don't know, weeks where the site, because what I had learned how to do was starting to get active again. So I, I was popping into these astral planes and I was popping into the control mechanisms. And I mean, I can not remember how many times like I'd pop into a space. I felt like, you know, one of those pop-up dolls and all of a sudden you're in a space and everything in that space turns around and looks at you. And they're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> right? And you go, oh shit, man, what am I doing here? You know, so I started to see a lot of the way uh, the psychoelectronical warfare was going on through the satellites, through HARP, through all of that it was, was coming really. And I started to learn how to trace it back to where it was being sourced from. Uh, so obviously I became a known energy on their radar. Uh, you know, so I went through microwave uh, frequency frying. Uh, I went through all sorts of things. That, that went on for a while, uh, you know, to the point I would, had such vertigo that I would walk sideways and, you know, to even get out of bed took me an hour in the morning because my head spun so much, you know. So, you know, these are all things I'm not saying to get any attention to me because, but they're things that are happening to a lot of people. And the fact is that they're not happening to me now. So, you know, so my position close me go. So because I didn't know with what so much was going on around us on all levels, I started to get up in the morning early again and I would go sit. And uh, this is another thing that for those of you that suffer, maybe you know it or don't, is one of the most important things that you can do is have a space that's your own energy space that you create for yourself that's safe, whether it's a chair, a room, a closet. It doesn't really matter, but it's a place that you can hold your energy in and so start to develop it again, especially if you're being ripped apart constantly by these, by these attention, by these, these type of attack modalities. Um, so yeah, I had, I chose a chair and I started to uh, sit there and listen and developed a certain amount of awareness. Um, and then it came to me that I am, I am the I that I, which is my ultimate state of my consciousness is located in a time and space coordinate. And that became my cosmic position. So I would just sit there and I would locate myself. It was inside me. It wasn't outside there in outer space or anything. It was inside of me. And I, I found this space in me that, this point almost in myself, that I would say that's my time, that's my time space coordinate and that's my cosmic position. And that's inside of me and that is me. And so, from that point of view, I started to be able to, instead of me being pulled off into all these other attack vectors and things that were going on, I started a, 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 I started to create my own center of gravity. And I started my own inner magnetism or vortex, if that's a way to describe it, to use energetic terms for it. And when I, I got to a point um, that was cohesive enough, then everything started to change. It's, it's, I don't know how to teach these things. I really don't. Uh, I don't know if you have anything similar, either you, Claudia, or you, Shane, to that, because um, we're pulled off into so many outers um, all the time that, you know, in the ultimate, there's no outer, no inner, but that became really important for me to establishing myself. And, it's uh, important for us all to establish that within ourselves, and sometimes it does take going through the processes like you did to, uh, you know, going through the group process to realize that you don't really need that group process. And although the the teachers have come along at the right times for you, they're again something you didn't necessarily need. It was again just a guide. It's not someone to make these things real for you. It's it's someone to inspire you to make them real for yourself. Mm -hmm. And once you got to Ecuador, it sounds like that's what you figured out was that all that time, all those little phrases, you know, your cosmic position, mm -hmm. all, all those things were just indicators so that you could could look look for that cosmic position. And, and you found it exactly where 
all of that teaching was leading you and that's back inside yourself. Right. Which is, you know, I was thinking about before we started this um, conversation that I realized that, you know, there are, uh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't like to use words that we're so accustomed to. So I would try to make a descriptors on them because we talk about soul, we talk about spirit, we talk about a lot of these things. And those words are so contaminated at this point that they mean so many things, like even talking about love. If you don't feel love, the word, you know, I mean, that maybe how, who knows what it means to how many different people. Um, so, you know, but I was realizing that in this, this moment that we're living, and this is why it's so important, friends, that, you know, this is a, let's not, why are we locked in the who's right and wrong paradigm right now? I mean, it's so, I mean, it, it's insane to me to see how easily we are uh, pulled apart from each other and how easily we are led into, you know, uh, accusatory statements and making somebody else wrong so we can be right. Uh, but in that dynamic, in that duality, you know, we need to understand actually duality. We really need to understand what duality is, what does it do for us, and why are we experiencing it? These are questions I'm not going to get into anything about it myself. I write about this all the time. But it's uh, there's also another aspect of each of us being unique. And I realize sitting here with these two beautiful beings that I'm with, with Shane and Claudia, I mean, man, I wanted to start this by saying, you know, I'm so honored to be able to share this journey with you right now. And I'm so honored that you came here. You see, because there are beings and there's so many of them. I'm one that's that came, I'm, I'm one that's been here for a really long time. And it doesn't mean that I haven't had all these other experiences and all these, these other uh, uh, universes and these other realities. I've had them. I mean, I have plenty of memories of them, uh, you know, different things. But I've been a part of, uh, call her Mother Earth, Gaia, Sophia, the the a goddess personality if we want to call her that that which came out of the pleroma came out of the cosmic center and embodied herself on this planet this jewel planet you know so i'm very deeply enmeshed in her. and this is what i'm learning right now is I'm, I'm i'm coming back to myself and in my own little tiny piece of me that is all of her too and then there's those of Shane, as I understand them, with Claudia and others that came from like super expanded states and brought themselves purposely down into this matter to have, be here right now. How excruciatingly painful that is. How it is for a being of that magnitude to be locked into a physical form and compressed into this body. So none of us have the same journey. And, and we've got to get away from thinking that. We have to get away from projecting our own journey onto another and saying, ah, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to go after you and prove you're wrong, buddy, because I'm not capable of understanding you. This is so not what we're here to do right now. And it's so what I'm about, if I can speak as, you know, from every plot part and every particle, soul, vibration, aspect of what I understand about life at this point, of what I understand about the cosmic journey that we're all on. We are on a living, beautiful being. And not just is she here, man, she's got the whole cosmos in her too and beyond. And we don't, and we're having internet wars, we're having forum wars, we're having, that's the part I don't get. And yet it's got to be serving a purpose, right? Let's make this a purposeful journey together. Let's have enough courage to examine ourselves and not project our own darkness on another being. If there's start enough in the world, bring your own light out of your own darkness. That's the only way you're going to get through. You have to go into the darkness, into your own darkness. It's not going to happen otherwise happen for some I guess that I you know this is why I feel like in spite of what it may look like oh my god you know oh you know Christine and Claudia got slammed man it isn't fair it isn't right there nothing will make it right 
Nothing will make it right that somebody re-evokes a curse and wants to throw it on people. Nothing will make it right, okay, that somebody wants to harm another and purposely does so. But let's turn this experience into something positive. We can all do that individually. Okay, this is an individual journey. Each person listening to me right now, okay, each person that has taken a side, get away from your sides. I've been saying for two years, three years, anybody that's ever read anything I ever wrote, I've been saying there are no rights and no wrongs. So get out of it, folks. The journey's in the place in between those two things. The journey comes when you finally implode within yourself and your own being, your own darkness with your own light. Then the real journey starts. You know, so it's so absurd. It's so absurd, okay? I mean, it's so beyond absurd that I have to think. I have to think the divine intelligence that is moving this forward right now. It's so obvious that this is what's happening. It's being shown to us. See? Uh, I, there I go. Off my soapbox. <laughs> Sorry. No, thank you. Um, said a lot of things that I think uh, were important for you to get the chance to say. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I, uh, part of wanting to introduce you and having you tell this whole story is to show people that we all have a voice and everyone with a voice has a right to use their voice. And if they are so inspired to do so, they should do so. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't worry about um, who is, I'll throw in my own little catchphrase here, vouching for them or backing them or mm -hmm. believing in them or supporting them. It's your voice. If you have conviction in your voice, then use your voice mm -hmm. and don't look for everyone else to, to uh, <laughs> agree. But once you find your voice, you won't criticize anyone else ever. I mean, you know, you can make fun and you can laugh and you can do all sorts of things, right? You can see what they're doing is wrong. Is wrong. Okay. I mean, I have to put it in quotation marks. I mean, you can see when somebody's either causing harm or you can see when they're manipulating the realities or you can see a lot of things you can simply see. You become the observer and you are the testimony to what you see. But really, once you've found your voice, like Shane, I mean, you have, you, I mean, the, Oh, anybody ever said anything about him? They thought they knew him. I mean, this is your infinite patience. I mean, you have infinite patience. Like I'm so astounded by it. I don't, but I have passion. I have love and I have passion and I have such so much coming and moving through me that I need to express it. I don't, you know, take it or leave it, folks. Really. We all have a voice. Find yours, write a blog, you know, open a YouTube channel. Let's get out of these massive loose farming forums, okay? That whatever the noble purpose they were set up for, they become loose farms, okay? Wherever there's a large group of people following another, there are loose farms. You're giving your energy to the, that which wishes to control and consume you. Step out of it doesn't mean you have to leave. And I'm not saying give up memberships. I would, but you know, I mean, well, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't give up membership. I was expunged. I was expelled, you know. But, you know, what I'm trying to really get at is like, step out of your comfort zone, okay? You don't need approvals. So step out one little bit. You're all magnificent. You're all awesome. You're all wonderful, extraordinary beings. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. Uh, that's really it. And I probably will have to just kind of like, I don't know if I told enough, said enough, didn't say enough. I just said what I said. And that's it. And, um, you know, I, I just want to kind of end with saying that it's very important to, you know, find your voice. So what I would call that is, is owning your light. And just as important as owning your light is being able to stand up and own your dark. Mm -hmm. And that, that is what Christina has, has kind of shown for you here today is, you know, she said a lot of things about her history that depending on your point of view could, you know, make you could, could be deemed as negative aspects or mistakes that she's made or, or things that she's done in quotes wrong, but she's owned it and she stood up from it and she's learned from it and she's grown from it and she's honest about it. And that's really all any of us can do. And that's exactly what we all need to do. That's, you know, bringing the shadow to light.
Yeah, I'm bringing, right. I mean, and it's, it's, well, there's a lot to say, but I'll leave it at that. And I'm just very grateful. And to my dear Claudia, you'll speak now. <laughs> I, yeah. I have to learn not to be the voice for the impasse of the world. <laughs> I don't want to become the, something that, uh, and that's another thing, you know, this is not about anything I say, find your own path. Friends. Go ahead, Claudia. Love you, dear. For the record, I'm standing fully beside Christine in all she said. I've had the gift of not only knowing her for a good three years now, but also getting to know her personally over the past six weeks or so. And I thank Bill Ryan for facilitating this meeting because without Bill Ryan, I would never have met you. Yes. As to the moderators of Project Avalon, um, where's your courage? Where is your truth? Some of you met me in person. Others of you have been talking to me or were talking to me for the better part of four years. And I cannot believe how shallow you have become over the past year. Did you? You, did any of you ever ask me or Christine what was going on? No, no, you did not. Nor did all your and allegedly our friends, the members of Project Avalon, who came licking our asses while we were moderators. And all I can say is shame on you and may you wake up. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. As we speak our truth, I stand with Claudia and I stand with shame. And I stand with all true beings who have made their own passage through their own self and their own beingness. I, w I have said so many times to those that have stood with me and I stand with them, uh, there is something called trust and honor. And those are qualities. And they're sadly lacking on what's happening right now. Nobody asked us. They allowed us to be made their enemy. And I will say for Claudia, I will speak this for her because I've sat with her in her home when all of this was coming down. And I watched her take for me, okay, a great deal of the attacks in her body. And I watched her hold in suffering her own broken heart from what was a true betrayal of what she had given for years and years and years and not just to the moderators. And, and so did I. That's pain. That's a suffering. But I, inside of me and she inside of her, turn that suffering within the crucible of the heart back into flow and love and positive action. She's an amazing, and I thank her. I thank her from the very depth of my being. And I thank Shane for being here. And I thank those that follow their own inner truth. All of you. All of you that follow your own inner truth. That know that there's a past called Gnosis. Know thyself. All of you, I thank you. There's no doubt in you. There's no need to attack another in you. It's so apparent once you see it, friends. Just look. Thanks, Carlin. I love you. All right, well, thank everyone, and um, everyone take care of themselves for us, and we'll, yeah. we'll talk to you again soon. Okay.